them. First four people that did this. So I went to the red on the box. For those online, we'll be starting soon, okay? Whoever's late is late. And you sit here just when I'm presenting, and that way you can let anybody in who wants to go to the meeting. Sure, I'll show you how. So if somebody joins in the meeting, I'll pop up the chair. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Oh, do you need to show me the screen? Okay. Six. 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 Uh, All right, so we're going to get started um, just out of respect for you people who showed up on time. And hopefully, you're glad you came. So at Nate, we honor and acknowledge that the land on which we learn, work, and live is Treaty 6 territory. This place is a traditional homeland for the First Nations and Métis peoples. And today, we were all part of this treaty land. Traditional name for this place is the Muskegee Waski Gun, which we also call the city of Edmonton. So welcome everybody. For those that don't know me, I'm Cecile and I'm the coordinator of the Maji Center at Nate. And so some of the Nate students might be looking around wondering, there's high school students in this room? What's going on? Well, this year, thanks to the support of ATB Financial, we have opened the challenge up to a high school stream. So the high school students will compete against each other and the Nate students will compete against each other. So you're not competing in high school. I'll put high school students against Nate students. We're you're each going to compete against themselves in their own groups, but this way we're opening up the challenge and we're letting everybody take part in a real problem that's faced by our community. This year we are collaborating with the Edmonton Police Service on our challenge. So when you find out, you'll 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 see it always is going to have a theme, and this year we're working with the Edmonton Police Service on our challenge. So I heard you boys. <laughs> Making fun of my first slide. Why innovate? Why what? Why should we innovate? Why should we innovate? <laughs> it's okay. I'm just picking on you. <laughs> Anyways, there, there's a lot of reasons why we need to innovate, but I thought I'd start with this video, and hopefully the um, the people that are online can can hear it as well. Right now, but they also need to have people who are out seeking the future. One is not better than the other. The fact that it's easier and often cheaper to start brand new businesses today than it's ever been before is both a threat and an opportunity. For an aspiring entrepreneur, there are a lot more options today, whether it's crowdfunding, Indigo, Kickstarter, whether it's digital businesses where I can get online and get moving faster and cheaper than ever before. The paradox is that becoming the best at what you do 
which is great. That's our job. Sets us up for failure in the long run. Most people are aware of Kodak. It was an icon of global commerce. It dominated the market. Years ago, they had the world's best digital imaging technology R&D. Somebody said in the company, you know what, wait a minute, that's going to destroy our core business, which is analog film. We're, we're making an extraordinary amount of money. We would be idiots to do that, but let's just bury this technology in the lab. Well, sort of makes sense in the near term, but if you think about it, they're going to be, I don't know, other people in the world thinking about digital imaging, and eventually it's going to get better and better and cheaper and cheaper, and that's exactly what happened. Fuji saw it coming, and Fuji acted. Fuji made investments in new directions, and today they're a thriving, profitable enterprise, much bigger than they were before. And Kodak is history. Innovation is really not just about coming up with new products or cute concepts. It's really about business design, thinking about all the aspects of the business. And changing some of those aspects might be very difficult for an established core business, but it's something that a separate group can experiment with and get it right before you start to transition it out into the real world. Innovation creates great companies. Every company really needs to have people who are scanning the world so they can take threats and turn them into opportunities. Angela, can you go to the next slide on my? So the innovation challenge. Now, how do you access everything that you need to know about the innovation challenge? So for Nate students, you need to join this nate.ca slash innovate 2023. So that's where you need to go and need to join that Moodle course. That's where we've got all the team registration documents. That's where we've got all the dates and timelines and do things and a sample videos. For high school school students, as soon as you register your team by emailing myself, or Maji at nate.ca, which is the email that went out with the documents that went to your schools. I will send you all of this. I will send you the list of the rules. I will send you the, the dates and the deadlines, and I will send you links to past year videos so you can see the work that has been done in the past and get an idea of what it's looking for. So what are you submitting? So you'll get next Tuesday at noon, January 31st, is the deadline to register your teams. So if you're an eight student in that little course, there's the documents, put your team name, the team members, and submit that document. It closes at noon. And I'm, remember what I said before when I was with Lisa, I'm a mom, so I'm a, deadlines is deadlines is a deadline. Um, high school students, you email them. You email me your registration, and I will send you everything that you need. Um, so, basically, we're talking about January 31st deadline at noon to register your team. If high school students, as much as they get lost in the shovel, and I just get an email saying, I'm, I'm trying to register my team, at least I know before noon you're trying to register your team and I got your back. Okay. The next day, you'll get an email. All the people that register teams will get an email telling them what the challenge is. So everybody's working on the same challenge same time, has the same amount of time to, to do it. You've got to submit a three, up to a three minute video. Can it be shorter than three minutes? Yes, but can it be longer than three minutes? No, three minute or less video pitching how you wanna innovate this problem, how you would tackle this problem. And you're submitting it by 11.59 p.m on Saturday, February 11th. And you will all have a link. So it's not in Moodle, so it's the same. Every every team will have a link for the specific to their, their team where they're gonna drop that video in that link. And I'll have it. And at 11, at 12, it shuts off and there's no more access to it. So it's very time, it's very time sensitive. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> very time sensitive, okay, yeah. I'm sorry if I miss it, uh, but what's the maximum for each team? Two to five people. Two to five. Okay. Yeah, you need two to five people on a team. Um, now let's talk about the prizes. Let's talk. Did you know that there's prizes? So, all right, there's prizes. So for for the high school students, 
Listen up. First place is $1,000 going to the winning team. Second place is $750 going to the winning team. And third place is $400 going to the winning team. Third team. Okay? You can do the math. If you, it's $1,000 and there's five of you on the team, what do you each get to take home? Six hundred for you and one hundred for each of the others. I like this kid. <laughs> okay, so I mean, maybe you want a team of three or two. Like you know, it depends on what you want to work with, right? Nate's students first place is fifteen hundred dollars, second place is thousand dollars, and third place is five hundred dollars. Yep. Is this all? It sure is. It's not towards a bursary or anything. It's cash in your pocket. High school students, when you register, and I'll send this all out in an email just to remind you after tonight's session, everybody who attended. Um, I will need a delegate from each team. A delegate is the team leader who's going to accept payments, so I don't have to pay five different people, and they have to split it up. So I'm automatically thinking I should not be trusting. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Okay, so 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 that's clear. Next Tuesday at noon, team registration. Wednesday, the challenge goes out. You have until Saturday the eleventh at eleven fifty nine to make a three minute video in MP three format. I don't want any kind of fancy video files that are really heavy and will take up a lot of uh, memory. MP three. Okay. Sign in for. Oh, I already did prizes. We don't need this. But I again mentioning the sponsors. Yay, Raptor Mining for sponsoring the Nate Track, and Yay ATB Financial for sponsoring the iSchool Stream. So I want to now. Um, if this is so um, before we get to Drew, I'm just going to quickly go in to. Show you where you can access some of the last year's winners and the year before um, winners. Okay. Then you just have to search for Roger Center. And there, uh, there we are. So then you can look at all of our videos and you'll find uh, previous videos and we'll just scroll through because it's going to be from last March, right? So go back, Elise Bell. Uh, here's one. Here's the winner from the year we worked with the Edmonton Oilers. Oh, this one. Okay. Thank you. 
So that year we were working with the Edmonton Oilers on innovating the live sporting event. That was the challenge. And so that was the solutions the students came up. When you go through the YouTube channel and you look at some of the previous years, you'll see sometimes there's talking, there's students, sometimes there's people presenting, and sometimes it's like this where they put it all together and slide with background music. So there's a wide variety. Each team will have access to a mentor. So once you register to your team, I will connect you with a mentor. So somebody who's knows how to, you know, talk you through this process and how to talk, help you out with, you know, coming, but they can't do it for you. And they won't, they're, they're just there to help be a good guide for you and help you get the most out of the, of the, of the challenge. Is there any questions at all about that part? Okay, so now I'm going to introduce Drew. Drew is the chair of our, our entrepreneurship and innovation program through the J.R. Shaw School of Business, and he's going to introduce us to design thinking, which is really helps you take complex problems and break them down. Find solutions. Hi, Drew. Uh, so, uh, as Seal said, my name is Drew. Uh, so, I teach in the entrepreneurship program here at Nate. I'm going to teach you about something called design thinking. Uh, I want you to participate a little bit. So, just to make sure you remember that you have a voice, say this. There you go. It works, right? Noise comes out. You open your mouth. You don't close work. So, ask questions. Remember, this works. So the innovation challenge uh, is going to give you uh, the way it's set up is going to give you some type of challenge, obviously, some type of problem to solve. There's two parts to this. We just saw the presentation part of it. So you put together a video, you're presenting your solution. Before you get there, you of course need to come up with a solution. The challenge that you're dealing with will not be easy, it won't be simple, as most good challenges are, which means it's not going to require a simple solution. You're going to have to use this thing inside your head to try to figure that out. You have a couple options. Option number one, when you've got a difficult challenge, is you can bang your head against the wall and hope that eventually something good comes out. Or you can use some type of creative framework to try to superpower your brain to get creative things to come out. And that's what I'm going to teach you about today. I'm going to teach you about something called design thinking. So this is a framework or a system to superpower your brain, to get creativity out of it when you didn't think it was there. There's lots of different frameworks. This isn't the only one. This is by far the most popular one right now, uh, and I think it's, it's pretty effective. To kind of explain what this is about, so there's an, an old story uh, about a truck that drives under a bridge and it gets stuck. Can't get it out. So they bring in a bunch of experts to say, okay, what can we do? Solutions that come out, so okay, we can take apart the truck. And so that it can go underneath. Uh, we could chip away at the bridge, so break away parts of the bridge so that it can drive under, uh, and lots of other solutions. It's said that a young man walks by, surveys the, the challenge, and then leans over to someone and says, Why don't you just let some air out of the tires? Let air out of the tires, the truck drives right out. This is what design thinking is designed to do take a problem, twist it just a little bit. So you see something you didn't see before to solve a problem. 
Here's a couple examples of this being used in real life by businesses. So Starbucks, enormous business, chains everywhere. A problem they were running into is customers were kind of becoming disenfranchised with Starbucks. They didn't want to go there because it was too trendy. It was too corporate. They found this out by talking to customers. Once they talked to customers, they made a change. So they don't do this everywhere, but they started changing the architecture and the look of stores based on local preferences. They started offering drinks that were, rel that were in line with local tastes, and it changed the way people saw Starbucks. Here's another example. Uh, so there was a doctor down in the States who was in charge of all the MRI um, in, this, in, the, in that area for children. If you ever had an MRI, they are terrible and they are scary. You go into this tube and you have to sit perfectly still. It looks like you're being slid into this crazy cave. And so for children, the ability to stay still in this terrifying experience is almost impossible. So what this doctor did is they just completely changed the way the MRI machine looks. There's actually a few of them, but they look like a treehouse or a pirate ship or whatever. So they made it fun. It's still scary. But it changed the way that these children saw the MRI experience and it changed everything for them. So they were actually able to get the help that they needed. This is the design thinking process. So there's five steps. You read different books. There might be four, there might be seven, there might be nine. Today we're going to look at five. Empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. Those are the five steps. But the thing I really need you to recognize here is it never goes sequentially. You might start with one. And go to two, but then you might jump to five and jump back to two, and then to three. It goes all over the place. This picture, I think, illustrates really well how the creative process works. You jump into it, it's a total disaster. You fail, you go back, you go forward, you go up, you go down, it's all over the place until eventually you start to get some clarity and then things start to make sense and you come up with a solution. That's when you hit innovation. It's supposed to be like this. It's supposed to be messy. It's supposed to be chaotic. If it's not, you're probably doing creativity a little bit wrong. So let's go through the steps. I'm going to take you through, and then you guys are going to help me a little bit as we apply it. As we go through the steps, we're going to choose our own problem. And we're going to see as a group here if we can figure out a solution to this problem. So here's the problem. Gluten-free bread is disgusting. If you haven't had it, let me just tell you it is. It doesn't matter what kind you buy. I bought 80 different kinds. If you toast it, it's okay. But just normally, it's gross. There's nothing good out there. If you tell me that there is, I'm going to call you a liar. There is. So that's our problem. We're going to work through this together. We're going to go through the five steps of the design thinking process. Step number one is empathy. Who can tell me what empathy is? I'm scared. There you go. You've got a voice. Bringing yourself in someone else's shoes so you can see things from their perspective. Exactly. It's trying to figure out how they feel so you can see things from their perspective. Here's the actual definition definition. The intellectual identification with or vicarious experience of the feelings, thoughts, or attitudes of another. Basically, what he just said, put yourself in their shoes. That's exactly what it is. When you empathize with someone, you feel their pain. You feel their joy. So, if you've never eaten gluten-free bread... Try to put yourself in my shoes, and I'm telling you, it's disgusting. It falls apart, it doesn't taste like bread, it's gross. So, empathize with them. So, how do we use empathy in design thinking? So, you've got a problem you want to solve. You've got to get out and empathize or get into the shoes of people that are dealing with that problem. There's three different ways typically to do that. For one, we immerse ourselves in their world, so we go where they are. There's no cities full of celiacs, but that's where we got to go. We got to find the celiacs. Where are they? Get around them. And we watch them. Creepily watch to see what they're doing. What kind of bread do they buy? So you might go to the grocery store. And, and this isn't a joke. You might go to the grocery store and just watch people as they walk to the gluten-free section. What do they do? What do they pick up? What do they drop? Do they start crying while they're standing there? Whatever it is, you watch them. And then you engage with them. I teach a class on design thinking. So if you're at Nate, please take entrepreneurship 3357. It's our design thinking class. We're going to cover this in 15 minutes, what it takes me 15 weeks to cover in class. But one of the things I have students do is they have to do user interviews. So they go out and talk to people. For this problem, it would actually be fairly simple. You go up to some, you'll find one person that's a celiac. They know 10 other people that are celiacs. And those 10 people know 10 other people. 
So you could very easily find people that don't eat gluten. You could find hundreds of them. And then you sit down and talk to them. What we're aiming for here is empathy. Figure out what's going on in their heads, in their lives. What are their challenges? What are their struggles? Why do they hate gluten-free bread? Okay. So I, I kind of answered this already. But help me a little bit further. How could I better empathize with people that can't eat gluten-free bread or can't eat bread so they eat gluten-free bread? Love it. You try it yourself. Maybe you'll love it and you'll think, well, this problem isn't a problem at all. But most likely you'll try it and think, oh, I feel like hate now. What else could I possibly do? Yeah. Social media. Social media. How, how can I use social media? Absolutely. See what people are saying. See what brands they like. See what brands they don't like. Good. Give me one more. One more way. Yeah. Absolutely. Those people that make gluten free bread have already done tons of research. So if you can connect with them and talk to them and get some of their information, then absolutely. So there's no one answer to this question, but we got to get out and we got to figure out how CDX feels on this. Step number two is we define the problem. We're trying to create what we call a problem statement. And we'll, we'll, we probably won't nail a real good one down today, but that's going to be okay. What problem are we really trying to solve? Are we trying to create a better bread? Maybe, maybe not. Without a well-defined problem statement, it's hard to know what you're aiming for. Albert Einstein said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, my life depended on the solution, I'd spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. Okay, let me, let me share a scenario with you. Worldwide, there's about 15 million babies that are born premature and well underweight. Across the globe, 1 million of those babies die within days of birth. It's terrible. Number one cause of death, what do we think it is? Why are these million babies dying? It's not just because they're underweight. Any guesses? So that's part of it. They're not fully developed. Largely, yeah, that's yeah, that's what we're gonna get to. Oh, yeah, that's 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 not the one, but yeah, absolutely that I'm sure that plays into it. Then and the fact that you don't know it is shows that this is a complicated problem. If you all knew the answer to this, you'd probably solve it. It's hypothermia. Number one cause of babies around the world dying because they are born premature is the hypo hypothermia, which means they can't stay warm. Their bodies don't have the ability to warm themselves. So how do we solve this in the developed world? So in Canada, when a baby is born prematurely, how do they keep it warm? Exactly. Yeah, it's called an incubator. So they put them in this incubator that keeps them warm and it saves their lives. And in the developed world, places like North America, it works almost every time. They may die for other reasons, but they don't die from hypothermia. So here's the question. It's not working in developed countries. And why do you think that is? Why can we not use incubators in country, like a country like in most parts of Africa, for instance? Why are incubators not working? Because there's a high cost. That's absolutely one of the reasons. That there's not enough sources to make them. Absolutely. You can say the same thing. Right? Not enough. Not enough power. Absolutely. All of those things. They've started, they would give these countries incubators and they'd figure out the power thing and all that things. But then what happens when it breaks? There's nobody to fix it. There's no parts, nothing. So th this wasn't working. So how do we build a better, cheaper incubator for premature babies in developing countries? <laughs> There's the punchline. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get there in just a second. So this was the first question. Through empathy, through talking, they changed the question. They redefined it. The new question became, how can we bring warmth to babies and of new mothers? You see how it's different? One is only dealing with the incubator. How do we fix the incubator problem? 
The next one is how to keep babies warm. It's a completely different problem. And it led to a completely different solution. So developing world, this is what we do. Sorry, developer, this is what we do in places we can't win the incubator. It's exactly what we did. Basically, heated blankets. So this is like a, a little sleeping bag for the babies. It's got this heating pad that slides in there and it radiates heat throughout the entire thing. The heating pocket that they put in there, all you got to do is heat it up in water and stick it back in. Is there any country in the world that couldn't figure that out or couldn't do that or fix that? So it changed the world for these people. Okay, let's redefine our problem. It's, it's nowhere close to the problem we just talked about. Nowhere close was important, but gluten-free bread is disgusting. That's the problem. So give me some examples of a problem statement. Okay, there you go. Yeah, the gluten. <laughs> yeah, it's missing nutrients, absolutely. I see you have over here. Yeah. How can we make uh, gluten free bread more appealing? There you go, there's one. How do we make gluten-free bed more appealing? Any other ideas? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's cure it. How come people with lactose intolerance get a pill but celiacs don't get a pill? Damn. Don't matter. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, how can we find that balance? Oh, there you go. That's much broader. I, I have some dances, so I'm allowed to. I'm making fun of myself. It's disgusting. So, let, like I said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna. This one, if you want to have a good problem statement, you actually should spend some real time on it. It's not the 30 seconds we're going to spend today. But here's some other examples over and above what you guys said. How do we make a delicious gluten-free bed? How do we change? How might we create a world where people eating disorders could enjoy food? So that's, again, that's not just CDX. That's lots of things. How might we convince people they don't like bread? So we're going to convince you, you don't need bread anymore at all. So nobody gets bread. If I don't get it, you don't get it either. Uh, how might we replace bread? So I, I, I'm not going to eat bread. I'm not going to eat sandwiches with bread anymore. I'm not going to eat hamburgers with bread anymore. It doesn't really matter. Like I said, we're not going to get there. But you can see how there's very different ways to approach this problem. The next one's ID8. ID8 is to come up with as many solutions as possible. I put a million there, but... It doesn't matter what the number is. Ideation is all about coming up with ideas, coming up with solutions. When you take my class, we go through a whole bunch of different methods to be able to try to figure this out. So I, I get your, like, I'll get you to brainstorm in 20 different ways to come up with as many ideas as possible. There's two rules in ideation. Well, there's more than that. I'm going to say two. Quantity over quality. Don't worry about quality right now. Just get as many ideas as possible. And number two is deferred judgment. If you worry about judging right off the bat, you're going to censor yourself over and over and over again, and you won't get good ideas. You'll just get the same old ideas over and over again. So ideate with me for a quick second. The, let, let's say the problem statement is, uh, how do we replace bread? We're not going to use bread anymore. See, the X don't eat bread. We don't care about it. What are we going to replace it with? Ideate, quick. Don't think, just say things. Lettuce. Lettuce. Meat, meat, meat sound. Yes, love it. Keep going. We're going to place bread. Crackers. Uh, corn. Corn. Potatoes. No judgment, see? Yeah, seal. Yeah, rice. Like rice. None. None. Oh, that's just another kind of bread. <laughs> I, oh, I judged. I judged. I apologize. That's not just me. I judged. Think, think beyond food types. Like, what else can we do? Seaweed wrap, there you go. What's that? Vitamins? Yeah. A smoothie, sure. We're gonna no bread in anymore, just throw all the sandwich stuff in a blender. There you go. Sandwich smoothie. So that that sounds ridiculous, right? But that's what brainstorm is about. Coming up with wild ideas that hopefully trigger you to 10 other good ideas. If we were doing this properly, we'd spend an hour doing this, but we spent 45 seconds. Okay, we ideated. 
We so let's say we came up with 20 good ideas. No, we came up with 100 ideas, and we took it down to 50, down to 20, down to 10, down to one. We got one solution that we think will work. That we think will work. Now we prototype. So now we got to give the users the opportunity to try out the solution. So if this was the product that we were going with, what would a prototype be for this? How do I do this exact thing, but cheaper and faster? Does they have your blind, thick blind? Sure. Other ideas? This is my prototype. I buy a blanket, I buy an instant hot pack. That's it. How much does this cost? Six dollars. I don't know. It's cheap. And then what do I do with the prototype? Oh, yeah, I take it to a mom with a new baby and say, try this. Tell me what you think. If they love it, it works. If they hate it, we go back to the drawing board. We've got to find a different solution. And we keep doing that round and round and round until we find something good. Here's some examples of prototypes. So you can see what we're going for here is how do we prototype in the least expensive and risk-free way possible? So we've got a smart, smart watch. It's basically just, it looks like Lego or something, with some type of post it on top. We've got uh, some type of game playing device that literally is made of paper. We got 3D printing. We got an app for a phone that literally is a piece of paper that you slide through to see different apps. <laughs> this again, this is like a 3D thing where you put the phone in there. Um, let's say you want something more experiential. Uh, so you do, you put a Lego thing together to show how customers are going to walk through the store or you create this little VIP room for a restaurant. These are all really inexpensive ways to let users try something out. Maybe you just draw a storyboard. Here's what would happen. Uh, the very first mouse that was ever made was created by Apple. And they're in deodorant uh, things. Whatever they're called. Uh, there used to be a little ball inside that you could twist and remove the deodorant on. That's how they created the first mouse. They got one of those balls, put it under a little block of wood, and moved it around. Is this going to work? That's it. And then now we have a mouse. Uh, let me show you a quick video here. So these people were trying to make an app called Elmo's Monster Maker. They didn't want to create the app because apps are incredibly expensive. So here's what they did. So they made a video of what the app would look like if it was real. <laughs> but all it is is a guy standing behind some paper reacting as if the monster would act. So creating a new app might cost you 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars. This cost them 18, whatever it costs them. Oh, I want to watch it again. Okay, so how can we prototype our solution? Well, you didn't come up with a solution, but so let's say our solution is uh, seaweed. Yeah, I, we're going to go with the seaweed one. That's the last one that was I remember. So it's instead of bread, it's seaweed. How do I prototype it? Yeah. So I go out and get some seaweed, go to the local ocean, get some seaweed, put it in a sandwich, and let people try it. Sure. How else could I do it? Sure. Get somebody to eat it. There you go. Absolutely. Let people try it. For food products, prototyping is incredibly easy. You just got to have people try it. That's it. So th that, that's a fairly easy one. But let's say I didn't want to do it like that. Let's say I just drew a picture of what the seaweed sandwiches look like. That's not a great way to prototype, but it's even less expensive than having have people try it. Okay, so here's our steps. We went through all of them. Empathize, ideate, prototype, and test. Prototype and test always go together. Remember, they don't go in order. Maybe you get to ideate, come up with a bunch of ideas, and you realize you can't find anything. You got to go back to the final. Or you get to prototype and test, and it's a disaster. Your solution sucks. Nobody likes it. Then you got to go back to the beginning and empathize again. It's got to be messy. That's the whole point. Just let me end with some mindsets for design thinking. The only way this works, this system, is see if you have creative confidence. Put up your hand if you think you're creative. 
Okay, most of the class, that's actually pretty good. When I asked that question in my class, which I did actually today, maybe a third of the class said they were creative. Two thirds didn't think they were. What I want to instill into you today, your creativity is just like a muscle. Put it under stress, you make it work, it'll get better. So you, the only way this works, the only way you're going to do well at this innovation challenge is if you believe in yourself. Going along with that is optimism. Let's say we're solving the problems we talked about today are not like gluten-free bread is not. It's not that big of a deal. But you have to believe that you can change the world. You have to believe that you can make people's lives better. So if we were trying to solve world hunger, is that solvable? I don't know. But you have to believe that it is. You have to embrace ambiguity. Ambiguity is the unknown. You have to embrace the fact that you don't know the answers. And that's okay. Most of us don't like to do things we don't know the answers to. And you got to be able to learn from failure. It's the whole point. If you don't fail, it means you're not doing it right. You got to fail, 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 and then maybe you succeed. Iterate, iterate, iterate. That means you keep doing new things. And then empathy. We talked about that one. That's improvement. That's design thinking. Any questions? It's okay if there isn't. It's okay if there is. Okay, I'm going to stick around. So if you have questions about design thinking, I'm here. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Let's learn about physics. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, on that whole vein of creativity, be creative, let your train your brain to be creative and ideating and whatnot. We have two special guests with us from Good Improv, Jordan and Dan. And while we get set them set up, please help yourself to more pizza. Okay, so there's pizza. Get some more pizza. We're going to get set up here and then. Um, this one? Yeah, this one's one here. Oh, great. He didn't even know it. He didn't. That was a perfect sleeper. Yeah, exactly. Start at zero and then figure it out. Yeah, that's the first one. Yeah, that's the first one. Think we can put it on the arrow key here. Okay. Excellent. That's better. That's for at least extract. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, Hi everybody. Welcome. Hello. Hi, my name's Jordan. And this is Dan. I took the liberty of issues with all of us. And thanks for saying only hi to me and not to Jordan. That's that was cool. <laughs> We're good improv and we are big fans of silly nonsense. And we'd like to share some silly nonsense with you today. Yes. So first thing I want to show you is this nonsense here, Liberty. It smells like a car. Because when you're wandering an apocalyptic wasteland, you're going to be concerned about how you smell. Make sense? Horsepower. New scent that's hot to trot. I won't do too many puns on these. And we'll say, oh, you're galloping into the store to get something that smells Thank you. good. I appreciate that. Dan considers puns to be a war crime, so I'll try to <laughs> yeah. avoid them. Structury, strength and luxury combined into one. And skidding. This is another one of our fragrances in our fragrance library. If you spread this one too close, you get skid marks on your clothes. The Jean Claude Van Damme. You're Gen Z, so this might be a reference that you don't get, yeah. but a little dated, a <laughs> little dated. Little dated. We're, we're getting old, that's true. And the Volkswagen Snow Spider. Now you might be asking yourself, what is this silly nonsense? What do all of these things have in common? Yes, car. Oh, art as well. Okay, art. Art. Car. You gave away the punchline, but that's quite gave away the punchline. But yes, they're all, uh, all of these are generated with the word car. Using this system of implication. And this is the system we want you to steal. Steal it from us and use yes. it for yourself. I you remember back to Drew's lecture a couple of seconds ago. He was talking about ideation. That's what implication is going to be super helpful for. Coming up with tons and tons and tons of ideas based on any, even as something as simple as a single word. Yes, this is the system that we use. And we use this to get comedic ideas. So we usually put the filters of like irony or shock or hyperbole to achieve our silliness. Presumably you'll be using a filter of engineering or something that's helpful to the world. <laughs> yeah, not just silly nonsense. So we've given you the madness and this is the method behind it. And it uses perspective. So you're going to use four different perspectives. To generate different statements and these statements are going to help you come up with your ideas. In this example, we're using car. So that's our inspiration. The object of car and with this system, it works best if you're using it on an object. Even if you have nothing. You'll get something with an invocation with an invocation. That's right. Nothing smells like nothing, but nothing smells like nothing. Mm -hmm. All right, so invocation, how exactly does it work? And how do you use these steps to get your ideas? Well, the first step is it is. And with this one, you're going to generate statements that are factually true, but don't just focus on physical details of the object. Talk about how, what, what is it to you? What does it mean to you? So in this example, we've used, it is made in a factory, right? It's true of cars. Uh, it is expensive and it cost me an arm and a leg. This rated number one in consumer safety. It is what gets stuck in the snow. And if you're doing this in teams of two to five people, try to generate two to three statements each on your teams. That'll give you about 15 ideas total for each one of these segments. Now, as Drew was talking about too, this is the space where there's no judgment, there's no wrong answers. Anything that you think is right is right. We're not worrying about filtering the ideas out right now. We're just worrying about creating as many possible branches off of the initial idea as we possibly can. Yes. So in this, try not to censor yourself. Try to put as many ideas as you can down. Even if you get some silly ones, maybe you'll get some inspiration from them. 
Now, the next one is you are. So in this part, you want to address the object like you're talking to a person. So you'd say something like, you are in a parking lot and I forgot where I left you. Or you are plugged in all night when it's cold outside. You are new and you smell great. You are taking your top off when the weather is nice. A lot of things you might say to a person. And again, the reasoning behind these, these different ones is just take a different perspective on it. So we're talking about it is, you're talking about just the basic facts about a car, for instance. Whereas you are is a more feelings-based look at it, right? So it's like what you are to me, maybe. Yes, so we've gone from objective truth, now we're dealing with personal truth. So yes. what is it to you? And how would you say it to, to somebody? How would you say it to a person? The next perspective is thou art. So in this stage, you really want to elevate the object, put it on a pedestal so that it's almost godlike. So you're really giving it reverence and importance. So in this one, we got thou art luxurious and strong like diamonds. That's where I got structure from, strength and luxury, mashing together. Uh, thou art protection from the wind and bugs at high speeds. You can almost use like Shakespearean or poetic language, and that'll really elevate your ideas to a new level. And again, two, three statements each for your teams is kind of all you need. Again, bringing the object up into the abstract, though. You know, we're bringing it out of the looking at it solely for its properties or for how you feel about it. Yeah. Down to the abstract and more like wide ideas about what this object could be. Yes. And for the last part, this is the I am part. So in this one, you want to strive to have your statements be very concise. So we've gone from really broad things. Now we're going to get down to really concise things, but these are larger themes that they hint at. I am freedom. I am luxury. I am horsepower. So these are going to give you really, I guess, uh, really powerful statements that are concise. Yes. So in this one, you're embodying the spirit of whatever the object is and trying to see it exactly from the perspective of the object that you're, that you're thinking about. And in this part of the process, try not to generate new ideas. Try to build on ideas that you've already established. And what's even better is since you're working on a team, try to try to do this to an idea that somebody else on your team has, because then it's going to be in at least two people's minds. If you've drawn from someone else, rather than you're building on your own ideas, this is a, a collaborative aspect. So, again, that's the system. It is you are thou art. I am that should give you roughly 40 ideas. If 10% of those are good, then you're winning, right? You'll have like four really good ideas. Some of them will be chaff that you'll discard. Some of them might be half ideas that might lead you down a certain road. And you might think, oh, okay, that works a little bit, or I got to tweak this, tweak that. But some, if you've generated 40, some will be good. I mean, just by pure chance, you're going to hit on something that'll work for you. Well, the nice thing about this system too, is you can do as many of these as you want, and you're going to get new ideas each time, right? Like. There's such a wide way of looking at things that you're going to get different ideas each time you do it on the same object even. Yes. So at this point in our presentation, we'd like to acknowledge our, our sponsor, Dish Dash. <laughs> a lot of people want to skip the dishes, but with this one, you can do the opposite. <laughs> you get no food, you just get the dirty dishes to look right to your door. Right to your door. So we've used a little bit of irony there, which hopefully you enjoy. Now back to business. Back to business, Jordan. Back Absolutely. to business. Take your ideas from a rickety old rust bucket that has a beehive in it. Ideas that are shiny and smooth, well formed. Yeah. That's kind of what you can do. And we wanted to give you a little bonus value. So this is another system that we use called Seven Things. And with this one, we want you to sort of stretch your mind and see how many different ways you can reimagine something. So for this example. Well, hold on, before I move past this slide, George, let's yeah. just describe a little bit more about seven things. Okay. So there's a couple variations on this game. A lot of there's three things, there's five things, there's seven things. We like doing seven things because it stretches your mind beyond just the obvious. So if I was to ask you to name three brands of toothpaste, George, you'd probably do it quite easily. Right. Colgate, Crest, and Baking soda. Right. See, so there you go. But once you get out of that, he has direct knowledge zone. So can, can you give me five of five of the same? Sure. Give me two more. Just give me two more. A few more. Okay. I can give you Dan's best value brand. Okay. That's his homemade brand. Okay. Yeah. And then Jest, which is like Crest, but it's in Jest. Okay. Now give me two more on top of that. Foam Co's brand. Which is I like to use Foam Co. They make a great toothpaste. It is containing a radioactive isotope, but it does clean your teeth very well. 
And then there's also NOCO, which comes straight out of North Korea, which is uh, a toothpaste. You have to order that one online, though. It's a special order. It's a special <laughs> order back on, yeah. So, but anyway, as you can see, the point is, once he exhausts his knowledge of toothpaste brands, he's now forced to dip into his creative mind and come up with something beyond that, but still makes sense in the realm of toothpaste. Yes. And some of those ideas might be silly, but some of them might be helpful. They might inspire you to do something. Exactly. So with this one, we're going to take just a part of a car. We're just going to take the glove box. And we're going to say, how many ways can we reimagine the glove box? How can we do this a little bit differently? Well, the first thing that came to mind was, why not a boot box? We can have to put your boots in there rather than your gloves. Uh, we also had the car aquarium, which is kind of fun, a little zen. You're driving around nice and relaxing. You can look at your fish while you drive. Yeah, have an accident sail right through an intersection. Insurance companies love this one. Uh, this one's a crate, just a wooden crate. You can slide your documents through the, the wooden slats there. Right? The reverse glove box. <laughs> and you can have your passenger get a nice little knee massage or work on your handshake. All right, this one's great. Oh, uh, sewer great. War crime. You promised no promise. I've committed, I did, did promise. promise. I've broken my promise. Cat box. Right? Well, the guy on the left, he's, he's definitely been there a while. Yeah, he's gotten real comfy. And of course, if we have cats, we have to have dogs too. <laughs> Ah, one customer sold on the dog box there. So, so yeah, set of things. Have a little fun. There, how, how many innovative ideas never saw the light of day because somebody was afraid that it would be silly or it would be foolish and thought, nah, I'm not even going to write it down, right? Well, that's a question we can't answer because it's a, an unknown variable. Probably lots because there's a strong urge to self-censor and things like that, but... I tell you, we're, we're doing this on an interesting day because I saw something pretty cool today. 39 years ago, Steve Jobs debuted the Macintosh for the first time. So the fact that that happened on the day that you're doing this innovation challenge is kind of neat. That's cool, yeah. I think pretty cool. That's cool. A good omen, if you will. Go back. And hopefully these silly ideas uh, will inspire you. Hopefully this system will help you. And if you want to learn more about that system or more about what we do, Scan that QR code and then you can website. learn more about that. And if you have any questions, we're going to be sticking around for a little bit. We'd be happy to talk to you or answer any questions you might have. Yep. But please steal that system. And we found it very helpful for what we do, which again is just generating comedic ideas. But I think you can use that system to generate innovative ideas just without the comedy filter, right? Yeah, exactly. So hopefully you've enjoyed that. It's all from us. I have a question. Yes. Uh, can improv help with networking and uh, interviews? Certainly. Uh, last 100%. time, percent. Yeah, last time we were at Nate, we kind of touched on first principles of improv, which is getting out of your comfort zone, having a mindset of yes and, and not being afraid to fail, not being know, afraid, to not fail. being afraid to look silly, not really of, being worried about that. Yeah, a lot of the great things that Drew talked about. There's a lot of good overlap there. We did a Venn diagram. Uh, so yeah, it's good for networking. It's good for building your confidence, especially your creative confidence, and getting away from the fear of failure. You know, because if you can look silly, yeah, then you you're empowered. Well, and specifically to touch on interviews, I mean, with improv, you you fail so often, like so often, so often, and you get used to the idea that that every conversation you have is basically improvised. You know, even if you're not thinking about it, that's basically the way it goes. Like you may think how things you want to get across. But you're not writing a script to, to do it in advance, right? So the ability to just open your mouth and speak your ideas is, it's huge, you know? And hopefully that will empower all of you. Any questions from anyone? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So just keep in mind that teams have to be two to five people. The deadline to register is next Tuesday at noon. 
I will accept any emails, questions, anything that anybody has. I will follow up today's session with an email to you just to reiterate some of the key things that you need to keep in mind for the challenge. Um, I can't tell you what the challenge is ahead of time. I won't tell anybody what it is ahead of time. You'll have to wait until the 1st of February to get that. Uh, it's a great opportunity. We've had students hired because of how they've placed in the innovation challenge. It's been huge on their resumes. Um, as well as you get to meet some really cool uh, people because we've got some amazing business leaders coming in as judges. And so um, I will also send you out the link to ask you to please, if you've registered, uh, register for the Innovation Challenge reception itself, which is on February 16th from 4 to 6 p.m. It is uh, where our, our judges will all be there to meet you. We will preview the top submissions and we will announce the winners as well. On the 16th at 4 o'clock, right here at Nate. Any questions? Okay, awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. And um, I really appreciate it. I hope you'll all register teams. And if there's more pizza, I hope some of you will take it home with you because I'm not taking it home. <laughs> and have a great evening. Thank you.